Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's such a, it's such a pleasure and such an honor to come to, to Trichy and to this beautiful campus and this beautiful state. Uh, and it's, it's so great to be in India as well. I mean, there's been, at NASA, we, NASA is inspired by the work that is done in India, uh, done by the uh, uh, modern Israel and done by uh, the other research in India. Uh, done by the Chandrayaan mission, done by the Mars Orbiter mission on the backside of the 2000s. When I saw that for the first time, I was so excited. Uh, India is participating in some of the largest uh, international collaborations in astronomy in the 20 meter telescope, 30 meter telescope, the TMT, and participating in the largest radio telescope that's being built on Earth. And it's so exciting to be here and see all of this work being done in India and, uh, and participating in it. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm going to be talking about one of the missions that. You know, NASA's really good, but we can't, we can't send a, you know, this Mars Arbiter mission is so fantastic that it was, you know, you, you built this mission and you'd never been to Mars before, and you never even tried to go to Mars before, and the first time you built it and you got to Mars and you succeeded and you're sending back the right data, it's, it's, it's amazing. So I'm going to talk about this New Horizons mission, which NASA sent to Pluto and is, uh, and is going uh, out beyond Pluto now, returning data from the outer edge of the solar system. To put this in context, I'm going to talk about where we are in the solar system, where we are in the galaxy. This is a picture of a galaxy. This is not our galaxy. This is somebody else's galaxy. But if we were in our galaxy, then we would live right here. This galaxy has 100 billion stars in it. That's uh, uh, hundred with their one with the eleven zeros after it, this many stars. And we're just one of these stars in it. And so when we say uh, one star, that means we have one solar system, because solar means the star, solar means the sun. And so we have our solar system, which is just one tiny part of the huge Milky Way galaxy. Beyond the galaxy, there's a hundred billion other galaxies inside the universe, and the universe is everything that we have. And so we have the sun here, and uh, we can put on the inner planets here, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And if you look at the bottom here, we have pictures of them. All of these planets are roughly the same size, more or less. Mars is a little smaller than, than the Earth. But, um, and they're all basically made of the same stuff. If you were to walk to Mars, you could pick up rocks, and you could put your feet through the, the dirt on the ground, and you can build a sand castle and these sorts of things. Same with Mercury and same with Venus. And they're basically made of silicates, which are rocks. Um, and if you uh, go out beyond Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the next planet you get to, it's which one? Jupiter, right? We have Jupiter. And then after that, you have Saturn. After that, you have Uranus. And after that, you have Neptune, right? right. And so if you put Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune together, you have what we call the gas giant planets. And we call these things gas giants because maybe at their core, they started with having something which was the size of, of, um, of the Earth or of Mars. But then uh, gravity took over and gravity created lots of hydrogen and helium gas from the solar nebula, from the cloud that made up the solar system. And so now that gravity just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and kind of took over. And so they have all this gas which dominates them. So if you went to visit Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, there's not a place to stand on. Uh, they're too big. Um, they're not stars, they're not making fusion, they're not making their own heat, but they're, but they're very large. Is that the end of the solar system? No. What's after Neptune? Pluto. Exactly, that's why you're here, that's why I'm here to talk about Pluto. Now Pluto's not the end either. Because if you keep looking with telescopes, we see hundreds and hundreds of other bodies out past Pluto. And these are called the Kuiper Belt objects, or KBOs, they're in the Kuiper Belt. But these things are basically like Pluto. They're small, they're icy. Um, so, you know, these things at the, at the inner side, they're made, of, they're made of rocks. These here are made of gas, and uh, these here are made of ice. And so they're made of different things. And Pluto is, in a sense, the first and closest object in, these, in this third class of planets. Not rocky, not gas, but ice planets. Now, people have been looking at the, at the planets in the solar system for a long time. Here's a picture of my... From, from my flat in Mumbai that I took last year. And you can see, on this particular morning, you can see almost all the planets in the solar system uh, aligned together. So you can see Earth, you can see the sun coming up there, you can see Moon, Venus, Mercury, 
Uh, you can also see Mars and Jupiter, not Saturn that, that morning, but everything else you can see. People have been looking at the planets, these planets, for thousands of years. It's easy to tell the planets, easy to see these planets. It's hard to see the other planets, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and the asteroids. They're just too faint to see with your naked eye, but these other ones you can see with your naked eye. Now, to put the history of Pluto in, uh, in context here, I just want to talk about its discovery. So back in 1874, French astronomer, Urbain Le Verrier, was, was looking at the position of Uranus. And he knew, because he'd studied the, uh, he knew that the position of Uranus was, a, was, a, uh, it followed, was an ellipse, it followed the Kepler's laws. But he was plotting, or supposed to at least, but then he, he plotted it, and he was like, it's not following Kepler's laws. It looks like it's being pushed around by some other body over in the outer edge of the solar system. And so he worked out the numbers, and he, he predicted there was another planet that's, whose gravity was influencing Uranus's orbit. And he worked it out, and he said, I think there's a planet right here. And he called up his friend, and his friend had a telescope, and they went out the next night, and they looked. And what did they find the next night? They found Neptune out there. And so this is remarkable. This, they, he had predicted the discovery of, of Neptune, and he found it very soon after that. And so one of the most remarkable discoveries in the history of astronomy. And you couldn't see Neptune with your naked eye, but he could see it through his telescope. So after this, uh, astronomer Percival Lowell, Percival Lowell was kind of like the tata of, uh, of the US back at the turn of the century. He had a lot of money, industrialist, doing good work. And he was using a telescope, and he was looking for, he was looking at the position of Neptune. And he was like, hmm, I think Neptune's orbit is being perturbed by something. And so he did the calculations, and he's like, I think there's another planet right here. And he pointed his telescope, and what did he see? No, he didn't see anything. Because <laughs> he was looking in the wrong place. And he kept looking, and he kept looking, and he kept looking. And, and uh, eventually he, uh, uh, he, he uh, hired someone else to do it. And he hired this guy, Clyde Tombaugh, to come out. And he wasn't using this telescope, but he was using a larger telescope. In fact, this is the telescope that he was using. It's a 13-inch uh, telescope of the Lowell Observatory. And what Tombaugh did is he, he uh, used kind of a trick here. Now, what's one of the constellations? Orion, right on. So, um, so you have the Orion constellation. And we call, Orion is a Greek, Greek constellation. The Greeks saw it 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and so all the stars in Orion, and they have the same shape. As they're, as they're going across the sky. So we see it, we see Orion rise in the east, and then we see it go overhead and set in the evening. And all those stars move together as a unit. And all the constellations are that wide. That's why we're still using the same shapes as what the Greeks had. But sometimes things move against the constellations. And if something moves and it's not a constellation, it's not a star, it's something else, it's a planet. Or it's an asteroid, it's a comet, or the moon, something like that. But it's something in our solar system much closer, which is moving. And so what Percival Lowell did, and what Clyde Tombaugh did, is they did a little trick. And so they took a picture of the sky. Here's a picture of the sky that, uh, that Clyde Tombaugh took. And uh, then he took a picture of the sky the next night, or the next week, in the same place. And he looked for anything that moved. So here you have part of one constellation. Come back a week later, and you have something else. Now, does anyone see anything that moves here? The whole image drifts a little bit, but... Looking for one, one specific point that moves. I'll show you. You almost saw that, I'm sure. <laughs> this is why it took Clyde Tombaugh a year to find this. He was looking, he spent the nighttime taking pictures, and then he spent the daytime searching uh, these images. And what he saw is Pluto moving right here. So these are the discovery images of Pluto. These are the very first images of Pluto that we saw the planet in. And so, uh, so this is 1930 when, we, when Pluto was discovered. Um, not much happened with Pluto for a long time. All we knew, we knew some things from Pluto. We knew that, you know, from how fast it's moving, we knew how far away it was. Uh, and we knew it was cold because it was far away. So it was moving very slowly, so we knew it was far away. It's, moving, it's very cold because it's very far away from the sun. Because everything in the solar system gets heated from the sun. But we didn't know much else about it. In fact, if you take pictures of Pluto, this is the best kind of pictures of Pluto that you can see. And all this here is sort of noise. This is a photographic film picture. 
and all of this is, is noise from the, from the uh, photograph. It's not actual surface detail on Pluto. But one of these pictures, uh, there was another astronomer named, uh, uh, the, the US Navy named Jim, Jim, Jim Christie at the, universe, at the uh, Naval Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. And he was taking pictures of Pluto, and he looked at Pluto, and he saw that Pluto looked kind of like a, there was a blob. There was this blob on this side, and then a couple days later, this blob had moved down to here. And he was like, hmm, what's going on? And at first he thought maybe there's a mountain range, but he computed how big that mountain range would have to be, and it would have to be huge. The biggest mountain range, like 20,000 kilometers high in the solar system. And so what he concluded is, no, it's not a mountain range, but it must be a moon or a satellite. Very around to the moon, satellite, same thing. And uh, so, in fact, what he concluded is that this is a moon called Charon, and it, it orbits Pluto every six and a half days. And so this is the discovery of Pluto, of Charon, in 1978. Uh, this is the best picture that we have taken with like a Hubble Space Telescope. So in that previous picture, you couldn't really see Pluto and Charon separated. They were just merged together. And that was because of the film that was being used and because of the, uh, the telescope that was being used. With the best telescopes on Earth, then you can see Pluto and Charon separated about like this. And so you can't, you know, Pluto here is about one pixel across. Charon is about half a pixel across. So they're really small. So you can't really do any science based on seeing things on the surface. Um, but you can do some more searching in the system. And so here's a picture taken uh, in 2006 by astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope. And they looked deeply and they found two more moons around Pluto. And these are the moons named Nix and Hydra. And uh, then in 2011, kept searching with Hubble Space Telescope and found one more moon called Kerberos. And then uh, the year after that, in 2012, I was part of the team that was using Hubble again and discovered this last moon called Styx. And so now we know there's five moons plus Pluto orbiting in the Pluto system. Um, all of these are pretty small. I mean, Styx is, if you make a map of how big Pluto and its moons are, it's much, much smaller than Earth, really much smaller than the moon. Um, in fact, they're just the size of countries here, uh, or cities. Pluto is about the size of India, more or less. Uh, Styx and Kairos, the small, uh, small bodies, about the size of islands and their Andamans, and just tens of kilometers across. And in fact, if you took everything that you can learn about Pluto, and you could put it on one slide as of, this, as of a couple of years ago, um, and uh, we, can, we know Pluto's size, it's about 1,000 kilometers across um, in radius. Um, we can, uh, from Kepler's laws, we can calculate its density because we know it's how fast uh, it takes moons to orbit it, so we can get its mass and get its density that way. We know it's made of ice, because its density is much less than the density of the Earth. Uh, we know it takes a long time to move around the sun, 250 years, that's because it's a long way from the sun. If it's a long way from the sun, that means it's really cold there, about 30 or 40 kelvins. We can take spectra of Pluto, and it looks like made of nitrogen ice with lots of methane and carbon dioxide, water, and some organic molecules on it. Not organic in terms of life, but organic in terms of having the same molecules that life has, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, the same elemental composition. And, but it's just too small to see any details on the surface. We can't see any geology, we can't see any craters, things like that. And so if we want to explore Pluto up close, then we need to have a mission which explores it in higher detail. Um, oh, also, uh, one thing you can tell from Pluto's small size is that it's cooled off. What we think is that it's cooled off quickly. Like if you compare, like let's say, you know, you have uh, these, one of those, the real small glass of chai, and you have like one of the, like a liter of chai. Which one is going to stay hot for longer? The big one, of course. Same thing happens in the solar system. If you look at Jupiter or Saturn, they have all this heat trapped in them because it takes a long time for that heat to escape, or even the Earth. But if you look at Pluto, Pluto's so small that it's much faster for it to cool off after it's formed. And so you have, if you have heat from formation early in the solar system, or if you have heat from radioactive elements which are cooling off, things like that, that would cool off Pluto a lot faster. What happens if something cools off faster? That means that it, if you have any volcanoes there, they die off. If you have any plate tectonics, those die off, things like that. So being small means that you expect there to be less geology, less new things happening, things like that on a planet. What do you predict on Pluto? You can, you can well, we know it's far from the sun. We know that it's, uh, it's cold there. 
Um, we don't expect to have any atmosphere there, or not a thick atmosphere, it has a very thin atmosphere. But you don't, since without a thick atmosphere, you wouldn't expect there to be erosion in lakes. I mean, there are lakes on Pluto, is there water on Pluto? I mean, there's water we would expect, but we don't expect it to be liquid. And so without liquids, you don't have things like erosion, rivers, things like this. So if you ex made predictions for what we would find on Pluto, you'd expect it to be a dead, dry surface. A lot of impact craters. This is a picture of an impact crater in, um, in Arizona, where you have a large impact crater in India, the Maharashtra, in Maharashtra, the Lonar impact crater, about a set kilometer or two kilometers across. And these are from asteroids and comets that come in from space. So you'd expect to see a lot of those, but not much else. Now you can study Pluto in a couple of different ways. Uh, if you have a larger and larger telescope, you can take better and better images. That's how telescopes work. They, they amplify the light and magnify it. And so, you know, Pluto is discovered on a small 13-inch telescope. If you make a 20-inch telescope, or you make a one-meter telescope, or a two-meter telescope, you can get better and better images. Uh, this is the two-meter telescope and the Hondra, uh, Himalayan Chandra telescope up in Leh, the dock. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great telescope. You can build, India is participating in the 30-meter telescope to be built in Hawaii. That's going to have fantastic images. But eventually, it becomes harder and harder to build a telescope which is big enough so you can see everything that you want to. But there's a trick that we can do. And you can only do this trick in the, in the, uh, in the solar system. And this trick lets us do, lets us study planets at high resolution. You can't do this for black holes. You can't do this for galaxies. You can't do this for stars. But you can do it for things in the solar system. One thing, you just build a bigger telescope. But in the solar system, what you can do you can build a small telescope and just take this telescope and fly it out to Pluto. And then you can take pictures of Pluto close up. You're laughing. It's easy. It's a lot easier to build a small telescope and fly it to Pluto than to build a telescope the size of Earth. I mean, come on. So, um, so that's what we do. So uh, this is NASA's New Horizons mission. This is a uh, uh, 5,000 core project. Uh, sponsored by NASA, the, the space agency in the, in the U.S. Uh, this is the size of, size of a Tata Nano. How many people can you fit in a Nano? Four? Three? Five? Four. Okay. Following the law. Good. Good to hear. Um, and so there's no people on our, on our spacecraft, to, to, uh, to our knowledge, which is good because robotic spacecraft is, uh, robotic spacecraft is much easier and much cheaper and much more efficient than sending people out there. This is Pluto is not a place that you'd want to send people. Um, this doesn't land on Pluto. It doesn't orbit Pluto. It's designed to fly past Pluto, take pictures, and send them back. And if you look at the end, it launched in 2006. It flew 6 billion kilometers to Pluto. It got there in 2015, a year and a half ago. And it sent back the pictures of Pluto and is keeping going through the solar system. And so if you look at the components of the spacecraft, we have a battery. We have a radio, and we have a camera, the biggest parts on there. Um, what do you all have with you that has a radio and a battery and a camera? Mobile, right on. So we're basically sending this iPhone 7S Plus <laughs> out, to, out to Pluto, except it has a one megapixel camera, um, but we have a long talk time, and we have a big battery and a big radio. Um, and so uh, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's conceptually about the same thing. We take pictures, and we send them back over the radio link. Uh, we don't have to come back to Earth for anything. We don't pick up anything. Um, everything that we everything that we detect, we can send back over over the radio link. And so here's a here's a drawing of our spacecraft. We have a bunch of instruments on it. Uh, the most important one we get most of our data from is right here. This is a telescope. It's about a telescope that's about this size. It's something that you could buy off of uh, Amazon.in for about one lakh. Um, an eight-inch telescope, sort of an amateur size telescope, but we get it really close to Pluto, of course, which is the point. Um, so that's this is taking optical images. It's very simple. It's just black and white. That's because if you put if you make this thing more complex, the more complex you make it, the more moving parts, the harder it is um, to assure that it's going to get to Pluto and be reliable out there. So everything is simplified. Over here we have uh, a UV spectrometer, ultraviolet. And so its job is to look at the atoms in Pluto's atmosphere. We're looking at ultraviolet light because it's mostly small atoms, and so they're vibrating quickly. That means their energy comes out in the ultraviolet. Um, oops, let me plug that in. Can you uh, grab that? 
So um, uh, down here we have the, uh, uh, the Ralph infrared spectrometer, and this is looking at the molecules in to the surface. And so these are larger molecules, and so they shake around a little bit more slowly, so their, their energy comes out in the infrared. Uh, down here, this is really neat. This is the student dust counter. This is built by students, both uh, UGs and PGs, at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And uh, it's, a, it's a piece of uh, piezoelectric film. And uh, when you take a piezoelectric film, you put a pressure on it, then it generates a voltage. And so uh, we have dust particles, which are flying through space. We're flying through space, so occasionally one of those dust particles hits this film, generates a voltage, and we record that. We get hit by about one dust particle per day, which is large enough to record a signal. And so we're actually monitoring the dust environment through space. Why do we care about that? Because all the planets came from dust. And so by looking at the dust throughout the solar system, we can see the history of how planets formed in our solar system and compare that with the dust that we can see in other solar systems. Over here, we have two more instruments. Uh, this is the solar wind experiment over here, which is monitoring uh, charged particles from the sun. And then up here, we have uh, another charged particle imager here. Put these all together, and we have, uh, we have the instruments on our spacecraft. So uh, our mission was, there's a lot of scientific interest starting in Pluto. Around 1990, scientists sort of uh, surrounded Pluto and started, started getting, uh, getting excited about sending a mission there. Um, and, uh, and then in 2001, NASA, ultimately after, after a competition and a, and a long drawn out, uh, drawn out period, um, decided to fund our mission, chose our mission from, from other missions that were competing, and, uh, and uh, we were selected in 2001. It took us about four years to uh, finish designing the mission, construct it, and test it, until in 2005 we were ready to ship it down to Cape Canaveral in Florida, the Kennedy Space Center, where it launched. So a couple of pictures from the construction here. This is the spacecraft bus, made mostly out of aluminum. Uh, this is being built at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, this is our infrared spectrometer, Ralph. This uh, main hole there, that's where the light comes in. It's the main aperture. Uh, Ralph is looking at infrared light, and so it has to stay cool. This is a thermal radiator up top. Uh, why is this person uh, wearing the, the bunny suit there and the, and, the, uh, and the gloves? Well, we're looking for the composition of Pluto here the molecules that make up Pluto. And so if we're putting fingerprints and hair into our instrument, and we've got the Pluto, and we take a spectrum of Pluto, we're like, whoa, Pluto's made of fingerprints and hair. <laughs> so we want to keep everything clean here. Here we have uh, uh, technicians putting on the, the, uh, the large 2.4 meter antenna that sends all of our data back and forth over radio link. Connecting wires on the spacecraft. Uh, I like this picture, it's just the, uh, the technicians with their baby there. Spacecraft spins while it's uh, being delivered to Pluto, so, uh, so we need to spin stabilize on Earth to make sure that it's balanced. And there's a lot of people, there's about 2,000 people involved with, with sending a mission like this. Many of these people are scientists, but not, not most of them, there's about 50 scientists involved with the mission, people like me, who are analyzing the data and planning the observations and things like this. Uh, but there's a lot of engineers on the mission. Uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, optical engineers, IT, uh, uh, systems engineers, uh, <coughs> financial managers, uh, writers, educators, reporters, uh, uh, program managers, project managers, quality assurance technicians, uh, all sorts of uh, engineers, scientists, and other people involved in this mission. It's a huge diversity of mission of people involved to, uh, to pull this off. At the center of our project here is Dr. Alan Stern. He's the principal investigator of the mission from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, I'm way at the back over here. <laughs> so when I started with this mission, I was based at the at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, right here. Some of our instruments were built in Colorado. Some of them were built in Texas. Uh, some of them were built on the East Coast here, and ultimately we took this whole spacecraft down here to Florida and launched it. So in January 2006, we assembled down at Cape Canaveral in the Kennedy Space Center to get ready for our launch. Uh, you can see that we're putting the rocket together right here. Um, and uh, so uh, here you have our, our launch vehicle. These are solid rocket boosters on the side, and these use a, uh, 
uh, kind of a rubber type of propellant. This is the nose cone of the rocket, and the once the spacecraft itself is very small and just in this uh, in this section here. In fact, to scale, uh, you can see that this the vast majority of the spacecraft of the launch vehicle of the rocket is just fuel. This is uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen, and it doesn't burn the whole way to Pluto. We don't take this whole thing to Pluto. In fact, we just take the only thing that gets to Pluto is this part here. Um, all of the all of the fuel gets burnt well before Pluto. In fact, it gets burnt in the first hour of operation, and then dropped off. And so this is kind of like it's kind of like going bowling. You know, the pins are down there, and you're over here at the bowling ball, and your job is to get the ball over there. You don't need to run the whole way with the ball. Instead, you just start the ball, you push the ball from here, and you let it go, and as long as it's going in the right direction, it's going to get there. Navigating through the solar system is like that. The laws of gravity, the law of gravity is really easy. GMM over R squared. We know how to do that. Galileo, Newton knew how to do that. So as long as we push our spacecraft in the right way, it's going to get to Pluto. The problem is just we need to, we need to build a good rocket so we can steer it, or so we can, so we can point it very precisely in the right direction. And so we have our, we have our fuel, we burn the fuel for about 40 minutes. <laughs> then everything disconnects. And the rest of the nine and a half years is an unpowered cruise to Pluto, where we don't have rockets that are powering it and accelerating it. It's just flying through space at about 30,000 kph um, toward Pluto. So here we are in the day before launch, the, as the launch vehicle is being assembled, and uh, we're rolling it out to the launch pad. And by by we, I don't mean that I was there like driving out the launch pad or anything, but you know the the uh, uh, the entire team and the, the technicians who were experienced this sort of thing are doing it. So uh, over here, this is Kennedy Space Center. This is you might recognize this. This is the vehicle assembly building, the VAB. This is where the Saturn V and the, um, uh, the pole for the Apollo mission and the space shuttle were assembled and prepped. Um, we're using a different launch pad, so we're over here. This is about maybe 10 kilometers away. And so we have uh, maybe a thousand or so friends and family in the mission who are waiting for this launch. We had a couple of delays, so it actually was, wasn't until the third day that we came back and, uh, and things were ready to, ready to be launched. It says, do not feed the alligators. Alligators become aggressive and we'll have to be destroyed. Luckily, we didn't lose anybody. Uh, lots of people out here with their, with their cameras. And, yes, and okay, so our launch, our launch went off successfully here. Um, and so it was, it was really the emotional and exciting time uh, after five years of building this mission and 10 years of campaigning for it to be built, to be sending this mission off into space. Um, it took about 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll show you the movie of, uh, of it in just a second here, too. You can clap for that as well. <laughs> uh, so it only took about 30 seconds for it to go uh, through the clouds until we couldn't see it from the, uh, from the ground any longer. Uh, this is one of the geologists on the mission. <laughs> uh, he's one of the uh, one of the artists and animators involved in the mission. And uh, here's the movie here. T minus one minute and counting. Turn that one. Minus fifty five seconds. <coughs> oh, Third know. stage is go. Roger. T minus forty five seconds. So these are lightning rods on the side here because uh, you don't want to have a lightning issue. Stable at step three. And you can see what looks like smoke coming off. That's just uh, water vapor condensation from the liquid oxygen, which is very cold. Minus 29 seconds. Dow plot. He is reduced to launch. Roger. 25 seconds. That is check. No atlas. T minus 18. 15 seconds. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have ignition and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on the Continues to look good as the Atlas V vehicle climbs away from Florida's east coast. The five solid rocket strap-on boosters are burning just fine, sending the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to the very edge of our solar system. T plus 35 seconds. T plus 35 
plus 40 seconds. So this is accelerating upward about the acceleration of gravity. Uh, so by this point, it's about uh, maybe three kilometers down from where it started. Okay, we're just tracking this with just with big telescopes on the ground. One minute into flight. So it's accelerating the whole way. We're using the, the liquid engines and the solid rocket boosters. Solid rocket boosters, they'll burn out pretty soon. And so there, you'll see them come off here in, a, in a, another little bit. And we're going east. We're going east because uh, that puts us right over the ocean. And also the Earth is spinning that way, so we get a little bit of extra velocity by going east rather than west. And SRV4 is SRV is solid rocket booster. These RD-180s, those are our main liquid rocket engines, made in Russia. T plus one minute, 45 seconds. Everything okay, continues to look good. One, two, Boosters three, have just jettisoned. Five, solid separation looks good. So at that point, those are just dead weight. There's no point in carrying them and accelerating the current. It's just going to waste energy. T plus two minutes. Start ground system securing. So at this point, we're maybe 100 kilometers down downrange from where we started, and we're still accelerating. It's going to be about 40 minutes uh, until we've gone around uh, much of the Earth and then are shot on our final burn off toward Pluto. This is the fastest spacecraft that's ever launched from Earth. Uh, if you take a, it looks like it's a lot easier to drive around the streets in Tamil Nadu than it is the streets in Mumbai. Um, uh, one time I've been, I've been passed by a Ferrari in Mumbai, but it was like in a traffic jam, so uh, there was no way it would go fast. But here, maybe you can get a Ferrari going quick. Um, it would take you about a year of driving to get out to the moon at that speed. Uh, the Apollo missions, anyone know how long it took the Apollos to get out to? Four days. Four days, right on. Right on. So uh, with us, we had a press conference soon after launch. By that point, we'd already made it to the moon and beyond. And we didn't plan on this. The applause for that goes to the laws of physics, because that's the only reason why we were able to get to the moon so quickly, it's just one half mv squared. We had lower mass, so we have higher velocity, so it's, it's a piece of cake. We have this, and our trick here to get out to the moon's orbit, or to Pluto, so quickly, is that we have the smallest spacecraft that you can build on top of the biggest rocket that you can buy, and so that gives the biggest velocity easy. Pluto's still a long way away, it's still six billion kilometers to get to Pluto, so it still takes nine and a half years but we need it, and we need all the velocity we can get. So, uh, we launched in 2006, we have a nine year cruise to get out of Pluto. There's only one thing in the way, which is Jupiter. After that, in Jupiter in 2007, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, until we get out to Pluto. So, uh, if we just take a straight line cruise, sometimes some, some of these, uh, spacecraft trajectories that you see do a lot of gravitational flybys to build up more velocity. We did do one gravitational flyby, which is of Jupiter. And so what happens there is that we were getting closer to Jupiter, and we're getting closer and closer. It's, and Jupiter's gravity is kind of accelerating us, pulling us forward. And then the last minute, then Jupiter kind of scooches out of the way, and we keep going straight ahead. And so we get a little bit of velocity from Jupiter, um, uh, essentially for free. And we slow down Jupiter a little bit, but Jupiter's so big it doesn't care. <laughs> Uh, and then we're, then we're out toward, uh, toward the outer solar system now. We passed the orbit of Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, but they're off on the other side of the solar system, so we don't actually see them until we encounter Pluto in July 2015. Uh, let me show you a couple of pictures that we did take at Jupiter. Um, this is the highest resolution global picture which has ever been taken of Jupiter, and you can see these amazing bands and belts here of uh, ammonia and hydrogen and helium gas at Jupiter. This is a composite taken with our high resolution camera, uh, which is just black and white, mixed with the color information from our lower resolution infrared camera. And from this, you can get the composition uh, of the clouds at different height in, the, in, the, in Jupiter's atmosphere. Jupiter has rings, and they're not as big and uh, intense as, as uh, Saturn's, but they're much younger in that we've just recently started studying them because they, they were discovered from spacecraft. Uh, this is a uh, 
some fantastic images of uh, Jupiter's ring that we have. You can see that the ring here, and it's made of dust. Um, and the way we form these rings is basically you have a moon and it breaks up and then that breaks up and that breaks up when they collide. And so you end up having sort of a cascade of dust that's here. And uh, we actually see, we see these moons that are made, perhaps making more dust. This is one called Adrastea, the other one's called Metis, and they're orbiting within the ring. Uh, so we have some nice movies there. Uh, and here, this is really cool. This is Jupiter's moon Io. So this is the globe of Io, and we, what we've done is just stretched out into a, into a rectangle. Now, Io we've known about for a long time. It's one of the moons that uh, the astronomer Galileo saw all the way back in 1610, when he was exploring the, uh, the solar system for the first time with the telescope. But it's only recently that we've been able to go close enough to Jupiter to actually make these amazing maps of the surface of, of, uh, of Io. And so this is from the spacecraft called Galileo, which went there in 1997, not the astronomer Galileo, who's been dead for hundreds of years. And uh, what's really great here is that you can compare the surface of Io um, from 10 years ago and the surface from when we went there. And uh, in particular, you see a lot of features here. This is just a, an empty area. But when we went there 10 years later, we saw a new volcano there. Uh, down here, we saw, again, something which was empty. But then there's a new volcano here. Um, over here, there's areas which there was something here, but then it's all been washed away since then. Why is Io changing so dramatically and so quickly? Well, we know that Io is, it turns out that Io is in an interesting situation that's being pushed around a lot by the other moons and by the gravity of Jupiter. And that squishes it a lot, makes lots of heat, that heat has to escape, and so that drives these volcanoes. But in, until we had images like this, we really didn't have an idea that the surface of Jupiter was, the surface of Io was changing quite as dramatically and quite as fast as it is. It's kind of like, I mean, if you have, these are continental scale um, <coughs> features which are coming and going. It's kind of like, you know, you're, you're just uh, flying across the ocean, the Andaman Island is soon, suddenly disappear. And then the next day, Sri Lanka is triple in size. It's, it's, uh, it's really dramatic how, um, how fast everything changes on Io. We see evidence of this changing. We can actually see it changing in real time. This is a movie that was taken showing the volcano going off on Io. This is from near the pole. And uh, this is a plume of sulfur, sodium, which is being ejected from the surface and then falling back. There's still gravity there, so it's falling back. Um, you know, the parabola on the on the surface. So that was in 2007. Then we still have nine years of cruise, eight and a half years of cruise after that. And so, what do we do during that time period? Are we just like, <laughs> like NASA waking up when we get there? No, we're we're um, we have a we have a whole team, and we know that we only have one chance to go to Pluto and do it right. And so we are spending every moment that we can of those nine and a half years making sure that our one chance is going to be done the best way that it can. And that means uh, uh, doing studies to find out where we want to image on Pluto, looking for new, uh, looking for new, uh, new moons in the Pluto system to see if there's anything there that we didn't know about. Um, uh, testing all of our instruments, calibrating our instruments, making sure that they are performing their best. Uh, checking our software to make sure that it is going to work properly. Putting autonomy software in so that if something goes wrong in the spacecraft, it will recover in continuous observations. Making backup observations on the spacecraft so that if one instrument fails, we take the same observations with another instrument instead. Making sure that our team is ready so that they're going to know what to do in an emergency if something happens. Uh, testing our software, upgrading everything. So we spent, we were very busy for this nine years. Now, not, the, not the entire team, not at 100%. Um, uh, the many people are working on other projects at the same time, but there's a lot of activity going on for this nine years to make sure that we can get the best science that we can out of this mission. Uh, what was I involved with in this? Uh, before launch, I was uh, involved in the calibration of our inf infrared spectrometer, looking at the surface of Pluto. Uh, I did a lot of the planning of our observations at Pluto, specifically looking for rings and looking for new moons, uh, running some of the software that, that uh, was useful for planning the Pluto encounter. Uh, and then with the data, I've been using that to look for new, new moons and look for new rings around Pluto. This is an example of the sort of software that we're using. Uh, this is one of the programs that I developed. And so this is essentially like a, you know, some of you might have a program like Stellarium on your, um, on, your, on your smartphone where you can use it as a planetarium program to show you what the sky looks like. Well, this is like that, but it shows you what the skies look like if you're on a spacecraft going past Pluto. 
And so you can uh, you can turn on various instruments here, and you can get a view of you know, the lit side of Pluto and the dark side, and where the stars are, and so forth. And this is when you know down here is where our instrument is pointed. And so this is to simulate different observations. So we want to know well, where do we want to be when we take the highest resolution Pluto, highest resolution pictures of Pluto's north pole, or its south pole. How you know when's the sun going to be shining on that, if it will be, and things like this. So this is for just for the science team to optimize their science. Now, when we were originally selected by NASA, we told them, hey, let's go to the double planet system, Pluto and Charon. But soon after we were selected, we started finding new moons going around. In fact, just before launch even, we found Nix and Hydra. And then after launch, we found Styx and Kerberos and Nix. Uh, or Styx, yeah, Styx, Styx and Kerberos right after launch. Um, and uh, so this is kind of exciting because we found uh, more moons going around it. That's, uh, that's great. More science, right? Can't complain about that. But it's a big problem. I showed you these images earlier of the rings of Jupiter, and you have the rings, which are dust, and you have the moons going together. And uh, whenever you have rings, you often have dust, rings and dust, and, and moons at the same time. And dust, well, we're going really fast. If we're going at 30,000 kph, and uh, at that speed, something which is just a tiny dust particle, a fraction of a millimeter across, uh, if that hits our spacecraft, it can destroy our spacecraft and end the mission. Now, we can't search for an individual dust particle, which is that tiny, you know, millions of kilometers away. That's not, impra that's not practical. And we can't redirect the spacecraft to dodge an individual dust grain. But we were thinking about this, and the more we thought about it, we have all these moons that we've been discovering in the Pluto system. What about if Pluto has rings? And what about if we've accidentally set our spacecraft to fly right through the middle of one of those rings? What should we do? And so our spacecraft is already, it's already going there. It's already on the way. Uh, but we were really concerned about this, that we might be going to the wrong place on Pluto. So we, we did a lot of studies. Uh, and we did a lot of searches using telescopes to try to look for rings. And uh, uh, we used the Hubble Space Telescope to look for more moons going around Pluto. And we used computer simulations where we just integrate the equation of gravity, basically. We would put a dust particle over here, and we would see where these dust particles end up to see if there was an area that all the dust particles ended up in, uh, an area of space, and we would want to avoid that area. Uh, what, we did, what we found out in the end, after spending about two years on this project, is we don't think that there's going to be dust in the Pluto system, which will be dangerous to the spacecraft. And so we decided to keep on going on our original trajectory right through the middle of Pluto, between Pluto and Charon, uh, which is great because we can get our best science that way because we can fly close to the surface of Pluto, close to the surface of Charon. So by the uh, beginning of 2015, we've gotten pretty close to Pluto. Uh, we're about 90% of the way there. And uh, we haven't been observing Pluto the whole time. You might think that's strange. Like, we have this spacecraft. Why aren't we this observing Pluto? But keep in mind that we just have a small telescope. It's, it's like a backyard telescope, you know? And uh, the point of having a backyard telescope is not to look at Pluto from a long way away. It's only useful to look at Pluto from close up. Now, by the time we're 90% of the way to Pluto, it's starting to become useful because we're close enough to Pluto that, uh, that we can take some good images. Before this, the Hubble Space Telescope still does a better job of looking at Pluto than we do, just because it's so much bigger. We're closer, but it's bigger, and it still wins. So by, by early 2015, the picture has changed, and we're closer, and so we, uh, uh, we begin doing that equation. So we tar start taking images of the surface of Pluto. So this is the first image that we released. This is a color image, and you can see Pluto, and just barely you can see Cher on there uh, in color. And uh, this is the first released image that we had. And, uh, uh, you can see these are at about the same resolution as those first Hubble images that I showed you, where it's, it's pretty fuzzy. You're not going to do a lot of uh, looking for ge geology on here. Pluto and Sharon are about a pixel across. But um, we're getting closer. So a couple of weeks later, here we have uh, an image where you can zoom in and you can see actual you know, Pluto here is, is a handful of pixels across, and you can see real features on its surface. Uh, now we have Pluto and Sharon orbiting each other. You can see they don't orbit. You know, Sharon is not orbiting Pluto itself, but it's they're orbiting their common center of mass, their common barycenter, which is how it works. Uh, this image here, it looks a little crazy. Let me show you what it is. Uh, the first image on the left has a lot of points. Those, those points are just stars. Um, so this is a very deep exposure where we're looking for really faint things. All these are stars. 
Uh, and this stuff at the, at the center, this is the Pluto and Charon and all of its moons. Um, so in this image on the right, we know where the stars are, so we've just removed them because we can take a picture from earlier and just subtract those stars off. And then we're left just with uh, all this stuff here, which is from Pluto and Charon. And then over here, um, we've uh, just put circles around them so you can see Pluto and Charon at the center, and then the Styx, Nix, and Hydra going in orbit. And there, there are these circles here. And so this is for the first time, this is when we saw the whole Pluto family. We saw Pluto and its five moons all together by new horizons for the first time. And so this is, uh, this is about um, uh, two months before our encounter with Seth. And we can see it happen. So this is really exciting to finally see our, our final destination. So by the end of, of uh, June 2015, we had assembled the whole team. Everyone was out of the, out of the uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab uh, outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, all the engineers, all the scientists, about 200 people. Uh, and so every morning we would have a, a, uh, a meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning and we release the latest images of Pluto. And so they'd be, every day that we get closer, we'd have more high resolution features. So get closer, get bigger, bigger. And then July 4th, they stopped coming. We were transmitting with the spacecraft, we were, actually, we were sending commands to the spacecraft. Uh, and we were actually sending the final command load for the, for the spacecraft's encounter with Pluto. And what happens is that the spacecraft is programmed ahead of time. It's, it's, um, uh, it has a list of turns, and a list of images to take, and a list of, of times, and it just executes these commands. It doesn't figure out by itself what to do, but we, we have a very uh, programmed sequence that we upload. And so we were uploading the final command sequence for Pluto. And without this final command sequence, our spacecraft would fly past Pluto and not even look at it. And uh, so we're, we're, we're sending this final command load to the spacecraft and we're listening to it, and then uh, it just disappears. And we don't know what's, what's happened to it. So uh, when we're listening to it, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're using these giant 80 meter radio dishes, the biggest radio dishes, uh, steerable radio dishes on Earth. And uh, so we put out a press release that uh, uh, we can't find the spacecraft. It's suddenly, it's suddenly vanished. And uh, it takes a couple of hours. We're hunting around at different frequencies. And uh, eventually, we, you know, we, so we call up the radio dish, like, oh, have, uh, is it raining there? Because rain will, will block out the signal sometimes. Nope. Has your motors stopped? Nope. Nope. Motors are fine. Um, and so eventually, we find it on a backup frequency. And it's very slow. And it's very confused. And what, it, what looks like has happened is somehow the spacecraft has rebooted itself. And uh, so it's talking to us. And uh, so it's kind of like if you lose your friend, you're like, hey, where are you? Where are you? You know? And, uh, and then they send, they send you a message back and like, you know, hi. hi. And so, so you want to figure out what's going on. Where are they? You know, are they OK? And so you want to send messages back and forth. But if every time we send a message back and forth, there's a cost to that because it takes four and a half hours, it takes nine hours for a message to go out, place the spacecraft to think about it, and then for it to send a message back. And we only have about 10 days until we get to Pluto. And so we don't want to waste too many nine hour long trips. Like, are you okay? Are you okay? And uh, so, so we, get, we, get a, we get our team on it. And uh, luckily our team is headed by uh, Alice Bowman, who's the head of our mission operations group. And so she was in charge, the one in charge with assuring the spacecraft remains healthy during its, uh, during its encounter. And so she has a lot of engineers working for her and they figured out what the problem was and, uh, and uh, uh, worked out a fix for it. So what happened, when we found the spacecraft, we woke it up, we figured out what caused it to disappear. And what, what happened is that uh, we were actually asking the spacecraft to do too much. It has, it has a uh, you know, CPU on it, um, and uh, we, were, we were uploading new software to it, and we were also asking it to compress images as we were sending them back down to the Earth. And it turns out that doing two things at once, it's a simple spacecraft, it's an old technology, and uh, doing two things at once was overtaxing it, and so it wasn't responding as quickly, and so I thought it, it thought that it was detecting a hardware problem and intentionally rebooted itself. But this is a bad idea to do with your spacecraft that you've been working on for nine years, the week before you get to Pluto. So this is not what we did intentionally. The spacecraft did what we told it to, but it was our mistake that, that this happened in the first place. It's kind of like if you're, you know, you have your phone and uh, it says, you know, updating the operating system, you know, and it warns you like but plugged in and you know, don't touch anything for the next hours it's installing, right? Well, that's basically what we did with our spacecraft. So we uh, got the engineers on it. 
They wrote their software, they tested it on the ground, so we have a backup uh, computer system on the ground that we have to test everything on. And then we send our commands to the spacecraft, and we reprogram the spacecraft from six billion kilometers away, so this wouldn't happen again. Uh, we said it so it wouldn't happen, and then we uploaded the new, the, uh, the final fixed command sequence for Pluto, so that it would know what to do when it got to Pluto. So two days later, we were back on track. And the image just started coming back in again. Yeah, that's the first thing. That's the first thing. Yeah. So our mission operations group there was, uh, was spectacular, and we were so thrilled that they knew what to do in, in the case of emergency. It's amazing. It would just start coming back down. So July 8th, July 9th. And now we're in the, now we're, we're starting to see some geology. You know, you can see some shapes here. Maybe these are craters. Maybe this is a mountain range. Who knows what it is? But, but uh, you can see some stuff which is, which is real here, for sure. Uh, July 12th, uh, this looks like a crater down at the bottom there for sure. Black areas, white areas, and so forth. And so it's getting more and more interesting every time we get there. So, um, okay, so Pluto flyby day is July 14th. And basically, you know, we've been flying for, for, uh, for nine years. And we basically have one day of observations when we're, when we're at Pluto. And that's when our highest resolution images are going to be taken. Um, and before that, uh, yeah, so I said some of our golden day is that, that one 24 hour period. And so let me tell you what's going to happen on that 24 hours. Well, the first, the first thing is that um, about 3 o'clock in the morning, we get our, our um, highest resolution global image. So the, the best picture of the whole olive fluid on one frame, um, uh, we get down on the Earth. And, uh, um, the Pluto, the spacecraft is still getting closer and closer to Pluto, and so at about uh, 7.50 in the morning is when it actually goes past Pluto and makes its close to the course, and it takes the highest resolution close-up images. Now, I can't send those images back in real time because it's a long way away, it's a slow data link, and as we know, we only want the spacecraft to do one thing at a time, not try to do more than one thing. It can't even observe and look and uh, talk to us at the same time because it can't point that way. So we've programmed it, to, uh, to just do one thing every day, uh, or one thing at a time, which is to observe Pluto, because that's the most important thing to do. We want it to send some images back to us, we want it to talk to us, but it's more important than to observe Pluto and talk to us later. Now, we've, what we've done is we've, we've set it up so it'll, it'll observe the whole day, but then it'll take one break from its day, which is 8 o'clock in the evening, it's gonna, um, uh, is when we receive a message from it, which is basically a message, a short communication that says like, hello, I'm still alive, I've observed Pluto, and now I'm going to go back to it. Just a short, a short message, and that just helps us know if everything worked right or not. And so, let me show you some pictures from this encounter. Uh, so, this is uh, from this day. Uh, this is uh, five o'clock in the morning. Uh, this is at the hotel that everybody's staying at outside of uh, outside of the lab. Uh, these are members of the student dust collector team. One of the students on the right there. That's with the Discovery TV channel, uh, filming them coming out. And then we're all assembled in the, uh, in, the, in the room here. This is most of the scientists on the right and the engineers on the left. And we're waiting for this global image of Pluto to be revealed. Do uh, you want to see it? Yeah. Yes. All right. So here we are. So this is mind blowing. This is so awesome. So um, yeah, you know, it, it's amazing. This is a whole new world. It's just, it's, uh, it's spectacular. And what we see, I mean, the first thing is that I would have predicted that Pluto would look basically like the moon. It's old and it's dead and it has craters all over it. But what we see is that you know there's not a lot of craters over it. You can see some craters here. These are impact craters where asteroids and comets hit the surface. But there's vast areas where there's not craters on the surface. And there's vast areas down here where there's nothing at all except for this white ice. And we can see some, you know, maybe some cracks over here, uh, some different colors over here. And uh, of course, we, you know, we love Pluto, and Pluto loves us too. <laughs> and so this is, the, this is part of the science team, these the geologists, they're looking at Pluto, Pluto for the very first time and seeing this brand new geological world that they've been studying from a distance uh, for the last 10 years and not able to actually see. 
Uh, here's the whole team looking at the, looking at these images, and, and, and I love this because this is the geologists, and geologists, their job is to go outside and, and walk on the walk through valleys and walk up mountains and pick up rocks and things like that. And what are they doing right here? But they're running their hands over the images and uh, and feeling for these rocks and pointing at their favorite mountain ranges and saying like, hey, you know, what do you think's going on here? Look at this glacier over here that looks like it's filled in this crater down here. Look at this crack system which looks like it's expanded. It has its flow in it and all this stuff. So this is this is fantastic to see. So um, so we spent the day watching these, watching them, you know, looking at this one image. Now we can only have one image come down because the spacecraft is observing the rest of the day, the rest of the time. And uh, by eight o'clock in the evening, we're waiting for the uh, uh, we've assembled and we're waiting for the signal to come back from the spacecraft to tell us hopefully that everything has, has happened successfully. Um, Keep your eye, this is some of the science team up here, uh, some of the postdocs, and uh, keep your eye on the, uh, on the guy down here too. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you a short movie from the Mission Operations Center. So this is all the engineers associated with the mission. I wasn't in this room, this is only the people who were like monitoring the spacecraft uh, systems. You can okay, see- you're in lock with carrier. This is Alice Bowman again. Uh, in lock with carrier means- for telemetry. We're standing, uh, we've received uh, we received some sort of signal from the spacecraft. We don't know what it's saying yet. Uh, but she's talking with the spacecraft operations people at the, at the dish in, um, in Spain. And uh, she's attempting to figure out what sorts of telemetry is coming down. She's our mission operations manager. Lock on symbols, so we're getting data down. The first step. Okay, copy that. We're in lock with telemetry with the spacecraft. <laughs> so uh, now, what that uh, Alice Bowman is going to do, she's going to go through all the spacecraft subsystems and ask them, is there part of the spacecraft working? Is the thermal working? Is the guidance working? Is the computer working? Bob, Bob, this is thermal on Pluto One. Go ahead, thermal. Uh, thermal report, reports nominal. Uh, all, all temperatures green. Copy that. Thermal is nominal. All temperatures green.
but there's still enough ultraviolet light and photochemistry that we can create some, uh, essentially haze, essentially smog, uh, like what we would have in, in, uh, in Delhi, um, on, uh, that falls down onto the surface of Pluto. And so it's red hydrocarbons. Looks like some of these hydrocarbons are being transported up to the, surf, up to the polar cap here. Um, uh, you see some craters over here in these regions. Um, but uh, in other regions, like, like here, you really don't see any craters at all. In fact, this, this region here looks like it's almost pure ice. Uh, and this here looks uh, almost pure ice. There's something else uh, maybe on top of it that's causing this to be a little bit pinkish and this to be a little bit uh, greenish purplish. These are probably all different types of ice, water ice, and uh, nitrogen ice, and methane ice, and, and uh, things like that. Um, if you zoom into this, to this area, which is the heart-shaped area, uh, it's, um, what you see here is remarkable, there's no craters at all. We think that Pluto has been there for four and a half billion years, because our model is that everything in the solar system was formed at the same time. Uh, all the planets are formed at the same time. And so, but what we see here is a, what looks like a brand new surface. And what I mean by brand new is not that it was just made yesterday, that Pluto was made yesterday, but that, um, but that it hasn't been hit by anything. I mean, we can age date surfaces in the solar system by how many times they've been hit by, by, uh, by asteroids and by comets. And something which has been ex uh, exposed for longer has, uh, has been hit by more things, and so it uh, so, uh, looks older. It's kind of like a lorry that's driving through the streets in Kolkata, you know, and, and the, it's, been a, it's been out on the streets for 50 years. It gets a little bit bashed up, right? But this thing doesn't look bashed up. There's no craters on it. It looks like it's brand new. Um, so this probably means it's been essentially repainted recently, resurfaced recently. And uh, these are um, uh, probably liquid nitrogen, not liquid nitrogen, solid nitrogen. Um, solid nitrogen is ice, and it kind of flows. You know how glaciers in the Himalayas, even though water, solid water is you know, solid, it can still sort of gl flow a little bit like a plastic, right? Um, and so it looks like nitrogen is kind of the same way here as well, that it's, um, uh, that it's sort of flowing a little bit. In fact, it's twisting, as, uh, as, uh, or it's, it's convecting. Um, is there's heat escaping from the interior core of, uh, of, uh, of Pluto, and it's causing it to, the surface ice is to sort of convect over and over. It's kind of like, kind of like a, a bucket of boiling chai, where uh, the heat is escaping, and so it causes the causes convection cells to happen here. Same thing is happening on the surface of Pluto, except it's with solid nitrogen ice rather than liquid chai, and it's happening on time scales of maybe thousands of years to overturn, uh, rather than seconds, but it's the same basic idea. So we, uh, uh, so we see this, and this is probably, this is soft ice, which is why we don't see any craters there, it's just absorbed in there. Um, over here, uh, right next to the, the ice lakes, we see uh, these giant craters, or giant uh, mountain ranges. You can see how big they are just by looking at the shadow, so we can measure the shadow, the shadow height to get the height of the, of, the, uh, of the mountains here. And they're about four kilometers high. Uh, how can you have mountains that are four kilometers high on what's this, you know, that's half the height of Everest, on what should be the smallest, what's the smallest planet in the solar system? Um, so we don't know what's going on there, but we do know this, they've been formed recently, because the, again, just like the ice plains, there's no craters on the surface of these things. No craters around here anywhere. So we know these were formed there recently. They couldn't have been formed there four billion years ago, because then there would be craters on top as well, if you would see. We see this big hole over here. We don't know what's happening there. It can't be plate tectonics, we wouldn't think, because the surface should be cold enough so that wouldn't be allowed, but maybe we're, maybe we're wrong. Um, you see these steep mountains poking through this ice. You see some occasional craters, but not very many. Um, and then let's move over to Chiron. So this is Pluto's, Pluto's biggest moon. And uh, the biggest thing you see on Chiron is this, uh, uh, this well, you have this crack system, and you have this big polar cap. Chiron has lots of craters on it too. I mean, it has more craters than Pluto does. Not a lot, but it has, looks like it's been exposed for a little bit longer. Um, this polar cap looks like it's the same red stuff which is on Pluto. But on Pluto, I said that was coming from the atmosphere. Chiron is so small, um, it's too small to retain an atmosphere. It doesn't have an atmosphere that we've detected. So how could this atmospheric stuff get there? We think it's probably being made on the surface of Pluto and then transported um, through space onto uh, to, to Chiron. And that'd be kind of like uh, all of the uh, uh, you know, things that we make on the moon, on the Earth, being somehow transported over the moon. We don't know how that would happen, but somehow it is. With this crack on the center uh, of, of Charon, um, it looks like 
this is the sort of crap that you get when you have thermal expansion or thermal contraction. Uh, that the whole planet looks like it used to be a little bit bigger and then it cracked as it was, uh, as it was cooling. Kind of like a big loaf of bread where you get these thermal expansion and cooling cracks as well. So that's what's going on in Sharon probably. But, uh, but there's a lot of mysteries here to how it could still be such a young surface. How these, uh, uh, you know, where, this, where these cracks are being. We went past all the other moons as well. Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra, Hydra. And we went a straight line. Our, our orbit didn't take us past all of the moons. Um, so some of these are from, from quite a distance away. Uh, but we still found a lot of mysteries with them. We expect these moons would be uh, uh, you know, in nice stable orbits around Pluto. What we found is they're rotating really, really fast. Uh, much faster than we would expect. We would ex expect them to be rotating very slowly because they've been there for a long time. They should be locked in rotation with Pluto, but they're not. So we don't know what's happening with them. We see some of this red stuff. He talked about Nix as well. Uh, what we do see are hundreds and hundreds of new features that, uh, for the sake of geologists, we're, we're starting to classify and uh, describe and also give names to. And uh, the names that we're giving are from explorers and literatures and gods from across the world from across, uh, including many people from many uh, historic figures and gods from India, from Africa, from Asia, from China, uh, from Canada, from Mexico, from all over. Here we are leaving Pluto. This is a backlit photo. We're looking at it um, as the sun is uh, on the other side. And so this gives it more drama. You can really see the three-dimensional relief of, uh, of Pluto here. It's one of my, my favorite images. And uh, so you can see that the um, uh, tall, tall mountains with their tall shadows here. The very, very rough terrain here that looks like that looks like cauliflower. Next to the very, very smooth, flat terrain here. And, uh, and then, if you look in the atmosphere, you see all these layers of the atmosphere. And how did the atmosphere get all these layers? The atmosphere is very, very thin. This is a much more complex atmospheric structure than what we see on Earth. So, what's going on there? We don't really know. One more image from Pluto itself. Uh, and so this is a panorama. It's going to scroll down. So this is starting at the edge of Pluto, uh, where you can see the uh, you can see that relief from the mountains here on the edge, and uh, and then uh, you can start by seeing some of the craters here, the craters here, and then we're just going to scroll down. We see more craters. These are craters into ice. These craters look like they have a little bit of rock in them. Then we have these scratches here. We don't know what's causing these scratches or these cracks. Uh, and then this terrain gets a little more a little more bumpy. Uh, and then finally, it looks like it maybe was frozen recently and more liquid with these areas with deep valleys and deep cracks in them. And then suddenly, it looks like an ocean uh, here where shorelines, where it just goes into this, um, into this convective solid nitrogen region here. If you look closely in the solid nitrogen, it looks like there's, uh, there's all these pits here, too. What we think these are are pits where the sunlight has kind of gone in there and evaporated uh, regions, leaving kind of a deep hole in the, in the surface. And we think those could probably come and go seasonally. On, on Pluto. And so, well, let's go back to our predictions. You know, I predicted that Pluto was going to be old and dead and look a lot like the moon. You know, covered with craters and not much else there. Uh, what did really find? We found that Pluto's, Pluto's surface is, uh, is, is, uh, is very young and that it looks nothing like what we actually predicted. Um, we were wrong. Um, all of my guesses were, were wrong. And, uh, and, but that's kind of cool, you know, because because if you, I mean, if you predict something and you're right, like, you know, what do you get? Like, you can clap. But, um, uh, but if you predict something and you're wrong, that's when you actually learn something. So it's much more useful to be wrong than it is to be right. <laughs> and what we found on Pluto, uh, all this baffling stuff, I mean, it's a young surface. It's not Pluto's name recently, but this Pluto is active and it's constantly resurfacing itself. It's like the Earth, you know, the Earth is four and a half billion years old, but it's really hard to find a rock which is four and a half billion years old, because most of those have been turned over in volcanoes and subduction zones and plate tectonics. And so most of the actual rocks on the surface of the Earth might be one billion years old or less. So something is probably driving uh, convection and all this activity inside Pluto. Pluto is warmer inside than we thought it would be. We don't know exactly why. Maybe there's more radioactive elements inside that are giving off heat uh, than we expect there would be. Or maybe our understanding of how physics works of ice and high pressures and, and low temperatures isn't right. We need, we need more experiments to, 
figure this out. Just, no, one's really, no one can build a Pluto in a lab. It's really hard to study these high pressures. Uh, we see all these mountains and glaciers that are flowing right now, all this photochemistry that's happening there. Um, it's an active and awesome place. And it's not the sort of place that we're going to go to look for life. I mean, all of the chemical reactions we want for life, I mean, there's water on Pluto, but it's frozen. It's, it's solid. Um, you don't get, you, it's not, it's not the, the, the temperatures are so low, the chemistry happens at a very low rate. And so we wouldn't expect there to be um, uh, life or anything resembling any early forms of life on Pluto at all, even though there's water and the right ingredients. You need a lot more energy and a lot more heat to actually drive that. So Pluto's not the kind of place we would look for life. There's many other better places to look at the solar system. So that puts it 2015. Um, it took us about a, uh, about a year to send back all of our data here. Um, we had about 32 gigabytes of data, and so we, that's all back to the ground now. And, uh, and after that, well, you know, there's still a the Kuiper Belt out there. There's still 500 other bodies in there, right? So um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to go past one of them. Uh, we have a Kuiper Belt object in mind. It is called, um, it is called uh, uh, 2014 MU69, which is depending which is name based on uh, when it was discovered and who behind. And uh, we're going to try to fly by this on January 1st, 2019. This is a very small body. Pluto has a radius of uh, about 1,200 kilometers. This thing has a radius of about 20 kilometers. And uh, um, so we're going to go closer to it, but it's much smaller. We expect to see things that are vastly different than what's at Pluto. Um, I would expect it to be you know, more cratered and, and, uh, and older, but hey, we've all been wrong before, so who knows. Um, and uh, so what about the spacecraft? What's going to happen to it in the long, distant future? Um, you know, is it going to keep on going? Is it going to leave the solar system? Well, yeah, basically, it's, I mean, if going fast enough, the sun is never going to pull it back. So, uh, so yes, it will leave the solar system. It'll keep on going. Um, if, if give it another 50 years or 100 years, it'll leave the Kuiper Belt. Um, it will leave the solar system eventually. The solar system is really big, so give it 50,000 years. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's going to basically move along with the Voyager missions. The Voyager Pioneer missions are out at similar distances. They're moving a little bit quicker, so they're actually going to always be a little bit ahead of us because they have more gravitational flybys. But eventually, us and the Voyager missions will all leave the solar system. Um, and yeah, you know, I guess eventually we'll get to the next, we'll get to Alpha Centauri and, you know, so forth. We'll get to Vega. Um, if we're going the right direction, it's going to take, you know, another five lakh years to do that because space is big, and as fast as we're going, we're going a lot slower than it takes to explore, explore the space. So uh, we probably have another couple of decades of, of observation if we're really, really lucky with the spacecraft. Um, we use fuel to point the spacecraft. We use uh, power, electricity from our, from our power source to keep the spacecraft communicating with us. Both those are expendable resources, so eventually they're going to wear out. Um, but hopefully we'll get another you know, decade or two of, of uh, use out of the spacecraft to explore the outer solar system. We're not gonna, there's nothing else to fly by probably. We probably won't do another, another flyby of another KBO, but, um, but we can at least monitor dust and monitor the plasma and monitor the solar wind environment out past to them. So this is our mission operations. This is our team here. This is our mission operations center at Johns Hopkins. And uh, thank you all for your, 